let's start with the Papa uh, prayer, All right? <clears throat> you go to your iPhone and um, go to papamio.org. Papa, P-A-P-A, M-I-O, Mio, Papa Mio, dot O-R-G. I'm going to say it again. Papa Mio, P-A-P-A, okay, M-I-O, dot O-R-G. I'm going to say the third time so you know clearly what I just said, reiteration, <clears throat> Papa Mio. P A P A M I O. Okay, Papa is priest always prayer apostolate. Mio, the Italian of my my father, my dad, my papa. Dot O R G. So you get it. Once you get in there, you have this one. See this one? Scroll up. That's the Pentecost. You enter into a church, okay, and you open the door. You see the icon of Pentecost. You go to this part here. Okay, you open the door, you touch it, and then you open the door. Since Jesus uh, is coming out greeting you, and so you touch it again, it goes gonna go to straight to the prayer. It's called prayer for a priest. Okay, so a prayer for a priest. That's what we're gonna be doing. And this is the soul of Papa. The very soul of Papa is this prayer. And we are all about praying for priests. Prayers number one, and uh, the um, the objective is for priest, and then the number two, the action is to promote people to pray for priest. Okay, prayer for priest. Okay, so we'll pray this, and uh, you don't pray along with me. You just listen and you pray along in silence. Okay, at the end we do the intercession, and you you respond and pray for us according to whatever is written a bit at the bottom. Okay. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty eternal God, look upon the face of Christ, and for the love of him who is the eternal high priest. Have mercy on your priest. Remember, O most compassionate God, that they are but weak and frail human beings. Stir up in them the grace of their vocation, which is bestowed on them by the imposition of the bishop's hands. Keep them close to you, lest the enemy prevail against them, so that they may never do anything in the slightest degree unworthy of their sublime vocation. O oh Jesus, I pray for your faithful and fervent priests, for your unfaithful and tepid priests, for your priests, laboring at home or abroad in distant mission fields, for your tempted priest, for your lonely priest, for your young priest, for your aged priest, for your sick priest, for your dying priest, for your, the souls of your priest in purgatory. But above all, I recommend to you the priest dearest to me, the priest who baptized me, the priest who absolved me from my sins, the priest at whose masses I assisted and who gave me your body and blood in Holy Communion, the priest who taught and instructed me or helped me and encouraged me, or the priest to whom I am indebted in any other way, particularly let us pray for Pope Francis and all the priests and cardinals and bishops and monsignors surrounding him, Praying. Let us pray for the conversion, a real conversion, metanoia of all the clergy, okay, from popes down to deacons, and for your local pastors. Oh Jesus, give them close to your sacred heart and bless them abundantly in time and eternity. Amen. Oh Mary, Queen of the Apostles, make, make your, your priests priest holy. holy. Oh Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make your priest holy. O Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make your priest holy. Saint John Vianney. Pray, pray for us. Saint Alphonsus. Pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, 
Before we go to face CBS, good morning, everybody. Morning, Father. Uh -huh. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Texan people. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, afternoon. Good night to those who are in, maybe in Europe now. And good morning to the uh, people in Australia somewhere. Or good night, very early morning. So <laughs> good yesterday and uh, good tomorrow to all of you because whoever watched this a uh, hundred years from now, greeting to you. Okay. And if you are in Hawaii, you're not where we are. We are in your future. Like <laughs> we're two hours, three hours before you. So for we are your future and uh, you are in our future and we are your past. So now, before we get into the phase EBS, um, I have something to say about Papa. Our um, organization foundation is uh, founded on the one mission to pray for priest okay that's our purpose also to pray for priest and prayer is not just saying prayers so reciting the rosary and you know i mercy in the chapel and go on you know uh, uh, station cross prayer is powerful prayer is something active and dynamic and we pray you understand when we study about prayer, prayer is a battle, a war. When you open your mouth and heart and mind to say a prayer, to pray, you have waged war. Okay? Nobody prays without getting attacked by the evil one, the devil, and the world, and your own self. Okay? So when we open our mouth, our mind, our heart, we say, I'm praying. You understand yourself will attack you. And the world surrounding you will attack you. And the devil, most of all, will attack you. Okay? So the word prayer and warriors are synonymous. And this is, we have studied this in the Catechism Catholic Church. Prayer is a battle to the death. Okay, so when you join this, you're joining, uh, the, um, you know, the, as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Okay? And Jesus prays. And whenever he opens his mouth to pray, the devil runs away. And he called his disciples to come to him and he taught them to pray. And afterward, he sent them out to cast out the demons to preach the kingdom. Okay, so number one, when you pray, you wage war. Okay, and so commitment is important. So you have to make a choice. Either you're with the Lord Jesus Christ or you're against him. And if you're against him or you don't follow, you say, you know, you know and just nothing, Jesus means nothing. I'm just, yeah, saying, yeah, I follow him, but not really following him. I just follow with the mind. I just believe you, but not really following. You're in trouble. You're the on the other camp. Okay, so now, Second point, we have seen or heard the witness many confusion uh, in the Vatican after the uh, the death of uh, our beloved um, Pope Benedict XVI. A time of confusion, and uh, many of the statements coming out from the Vatican uh, reporting: if you are true Catholic, you need to keep you know follow follow up with the uh, updating with the news of the church you're not just a local catholic you're not just belonging to your local church or parish and a lot of catholics just keep thinking that oh i, I belong to my parish that's it huh? and then then a lot of papa people now have learned to understand that you're catholic that means you're global you're universal catholic and universal so everywhere anywhere in the world there is some kind of pain suffering death or war, we pray. And anything happened in the Vatican, we have to be aware of it. We need to be knowledgeable. Okay? So, you will have, let's see, the war is not just against the flesh, the world, and the devil, but against ignorance as well. So, we have to keep up with the news from the Vatican, which is the heart of the Catholic Church. Okay? So, what happened in the past week? Some reports saying that our present Pope cursed and swear, saying vulgar words, vulgar, vulgarity, 
the many reports. Is it true or not? We think it is. If it were true, we need to pray for the Pope. It was, if it were false, we pray for the Pope and pray for everybody who want to attack the Catholic Church. Number two, the report coming from the Vatican that um, our present Pope telling the seminarians and um, he even say that all priests should forgive all sins when it, whenever people go to confession. And if you don't forgive sins or give absolution to anybody, then that priest is a delinquent. And that means he is a criminal. And the statement is that coming from the Pope. The Pope saying, even you know, if the person commit adultery and that person does not repent, or uh, the person is living in the sodomite way of life, okay, sodomite men with men, women with women, and they you know they come to confession, and the priest has to give absolution, even if they don't change the way of life. Okay, so a person living an adulterous life or fornicators, okay. Uh, man, woman living together, not being um, husband and wife, and that person keeps that relationship and goes to confession, then the priest has to give absolution. That is wrong, okay? And uh, if a husband living, you know, have a wife and he goes out, he committed adultery, he goes to confession, and he does not want to leave the adulterous life, just keeping that and he goes to confession, and the priest had to forgive him or uh, give absolution. That is something wrong, okay? So that this, this is a second statement on the Vatican. So confusion time, okay? There's a lot of evil spirit going on here. And then our own Cardinal uh, Leroy from San Diego, he's big Cardinal and he's promoting blessing and letting men, marrying men and blessing them. And, you know, sort of my marriage matrimony and allowing women to be ordained priests. And he wants to change the law of the church. He changed, uh, wants the law change the gospel and the Bible. Okay, statements. Is that true? Let's think critically. And so we stay calm, cool, composed, collected, and pray for priest all the more. Okay, now, last thing I mentioned after the, um, uh, the death of uh, Pope Benedict XVI series of books come from, coming from many sources um, exposing what's going on in the Vatican, in the church, the uh, clerical abuse, okay? So many, many things in the near future, several days from now, a week from now, you hear a lot, okay? A lot. And um, even one in one of the writing of uh, uh, the Emeritus, um, late Pope Benedict XVI, he mentioned about there are in the seminaries gay clubs, sodomites. Okay? He said it. <coughs> Is it true? Is it true? That's the question. Is it correct? Is it reasonable? But just a false accusation. I bear witness to it. I live in a seminary. I know there's a, such a kind of a culture. Subculture now is coming to the fore. It's coming out and, you know, these people are the leaders of the Catholic Church. All the more we need to pray for priests. We don't give up. This is a, the fight to the death. This is war. Okay? I want to go to heaven. And I know I'm not strong enough. I'm a sinner like everybody. But still, I want to go to heaven. That's why we go to the face of Jesus Christ. We study him. We study the word. Go back to the word. And we study. According, as you know, according to St. Jerome. God walked as God walked in, the, in paradise. Okay. To seek Adam. Now he walks in the gospel, in the Bible, in the sacred scripture. To seek you. So the gospel, the word of God, the Bible is paradise. Now, you want to seek God, walk in the land of sacredness, which is the Bible land, which is the church. Okay, that's what we are doing. 
we're not just uh, doing this for the sake of okay you know you know i'm i'm famous because i know i teach the bible or i want to you know boast about knowing the bible or uh, you want to um, well defend yourself well, we we do that we defend ourselves and clarify ourselves and make it clear argue about uh, the faith yes but the most important thing is to get to know the lord to meet the lord in the land of the word the sacred words okay so i end there on our prayer for priests now face ebs what is face ebs face mean face to face this is a Viet culture okay the Viet culture as you know i've taught this before and we prefer three faces one word ba mặt một lời so always not two but three Three faces, one word. That means we create, we agree on the same word, same idea, same word. Okay, that's called unity, no division. And we prefer to see face to face. Okay, I want to see your eyes, the white of your eyes. I see your face. Okay, and uh, I spoke with uh, Maria. You see the art right now. Faceless people, family, father, mother, grandpa, grandma, you no face. Hmm? You don't want it. And just give a texture, color, whatever. Blue, red, green, white, whatever. But no face, not human. See? So you could have a shape of a, a form of a human body, but no face. There's no soul. So we want to see the face. Look into the face and look into the eyes of the person. That's a beard culture. And you know, three faces, one word. And so we want to see the face of God. And the face of God is Jesus Christ. And so the prayer said, um, look upon Christ, right? Look upon the priest, the priest says, through your son. So God the Father, you know, so the prayer, we just pray. Let's repeat that one. I'm going to pray that, let's say it again. Almighty God, which is the Father, okay? Look upon the face of Christ. So God the Father from above looking down on, or on earth or on us. And he sees through the face of Jesus Christ. And we look up at God the Father through the face of Jesus Christ. So the face of Jesus Christ is the bridge. And the Father will not punish us because he sees the face of his son, beloved son. And we look at the face of Jesus Christ and we have no fear because we know the Father is merciful through the face of Jesus Christ. And this is what we're studying. We're studying the face of Jesus Christ. That's why we call it face EBS. And in you, each and every one of you, your face is a reflection of the face of God. Because we're created in his image and likeness. Okay. So phase E B S. Z is Zoom, B is Bible, S is study. So the word study means we are student. The Lord does did not call us to be just mere Christian, mere Christianity. Yeah. He did not call us to be, you know, um, faithful. He never, you could not find anywhere that Jesus called you to be a Christian. Or to be a faithful. You could say, I'm a believer. Yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't follow his uh, precepts or footsteps. You could promote uh, or say, boast, I'm a believer. Yeah, I believe in the name, but you're not a Christian yet. But a Christian, oh, well, I am a Christian, but you don't follow him. You see, what he called is, he calls disciples. He called students. And how many of us, we, are, we, we claim to be Christian, Catholics, and believer, but we are not his disciples. So disciples mean students. Yeah? So how many Catholics are truly Jesus' disciples? Many Catholics, billions, right? How many are disciples? How many are his students? We're called to be his students. Hmm. That means you have to study him. Yes, so they study the man, God, God, man. And so this is a personal relationship. You have to meet him in person. Okay, so I end there. And now let's go to the methodology, the technique to learn, uh, to study. Since we're, we're students, okay, so we use our mind. We study by the mind, the senses. So we have the senses, we have the mind. The mind is for thinking, reasoning. The senses for the perceptions. Okay, so... We're going to divide this. This is a method. We're going to ask question, only one question. The question is, what? 
but that question is divided into three questions. What is it, so what, and now what? Okay, one what question. So whenever you hear anybody says anything, okay, priest, pope, bishop, president, king, queens, you have to ask the question, what is the point? Even Father Michael, what is your point, Father? I'm, I'm, my point is about the what question right now. Okay, and that what question is divided into three parts. What is the point? Where is it? So what? How is it related to me? Relevance. Okay. And third, what am I going to do about it? Okay. I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm do something about it. So one what question. And this is the weapon. Okay. The question you're going anywhere. Okay. Anywhere. Not just for the Bible study. Okay. You ask that question. Yourself and the people in your family, your children, husband, wife, you ask the question. Because when you do this, you will not get emotional. When somebody attacks you, insults you, and, and um, you ask, uh, what do you mean? Somebody say, okay, Father Michael, you look really fat today. What do you mean? I, I don't understand what you mean. Could you clarify that? Yeah, yesterday you look like you're 90 pounds, now you're 198 pounds, something like that. I'll give you an example, right? So you don't get emotional. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm ugly. No, no. Ask the question. Ask the question. What do you mean, Maroda? Yeah. Ask the question. You don't need to react. Once you have that question, it's very powerful. I don't really understand. You know, so you have to bind your feeling, don't feel anything yet. Ask the question, what do you mean by that? And and um, and then the person gives you answer and then uh, ugly. And you say, why? Why do you say that? See, very simple. Why is a relevant question. So what, right? Two questions. Just what do you mean by that? What is the point and why? That is a so what question. Very powerful, powerful tools. I'm giving you the tools, the techniques of thinking. Does it make sense so far? Yeah? So you say, Father Michael, you're so fat and ugly. I give you so not really. I'm, I'm beautiful and I'm not that fat, okay? So um, so what? What are you going to do about it? So I'm, look, I'm looking fat and ugly. So what are you going to do about it, right? So I give you an example of using this tool. By anything, when writing and speaking and listening, ask the what question. What is your point? Don't beat around the bush. Go straight to the point. And uh, you have self-composure. Does it make sense, anybody? Yes. Okay. Now, um, in filming, I'll give you some suggestion. Always get the light shine on your face. Okay? Get the light shine on your face. Okay? Don't let the light shine at the camera. So that's better. Somehow, and then some people do not have that experience. So it's better to do that. Okay, now, three, four questions. We divide this um, this uh, study into three parts. Okay, three. Everything three. Three phases, one word. So three parts. One, uh, three, four question. What, uh, what question? And then three parts. First part, I will summarize the readings. Okay, the materials are the readings of the previous... Sunday readings, okay? That means hindsight. You have attended the mass. You have heard many homilies and you have attended attentively. So you brought along with you a piece of paper and a pencil and you write the point of the homily. Yeah, you heard the readings already. You write down what the homily was about. What is the point and what have what does it have anything to do with you, your life, okay? So we're going to study that part. So the first part, I'm going to summarize all the readings of the previous Sunday, which is, is that a third or second Sunday? Third. Uh, third, okay. So you need to know that. And how many readings are the liturgy of the word? How many readings are there? First reading, this Sunday, right? Uh, cycle A, right? First reading, responsorial. Second reading. And gospel. And then the homily. The liturgy of the word has five, okay, consists of five parts, okay? 
first reading, responsorial, second reading, the gospel of the homily is considered, considered part of the liturgy of the word. So liturgy of the word, and then the next part is the liturgy of the Eucharist. Intercession is offering up. It's offering. Yeah? So you offer your heart and your needs and your desire and yeah, whatever you offer it up and then you offer the gifts. And then the priest would take all those offering and he offers up at the, uh, at the um, liturgy of the Eucharist. Yeah? After the credo, you go to the offertory. That's part of the Eucharist already. Does it make sense? The Mass is con consists, of, consists of two parts. Liturgy of the Word, main part, okay? And Liturgy of the Eucharist. Okay? Okay. So, we're going to focus on the Liturgy of the Word. And we're going to focus on the reading. Okay? The first part, I will some give you a synopsis, synopsis of uh, the readings. The second part, we'll share. We'll share what we, um, um, we uh, collected, okay? uh, we recorded. And then the third part, we get into the scripture and we study from the biblical perspective too, not, not the pastoral. Now we go straight into the first part. Now tell me, uh, what Sunday is it now again? Third. Okay, what cycle is it? A. Okay, very good. Um, first reading Isaiah. The theme simple. The theme is light. Okay, and this is the anticipation, anticipation of the gospel. Now, the church purposely chose this Isaiah, which correspond to the reading we'll be reading in the gospel, Matthew. Okay, it's all about light and the great light is coming. Okay, coming from the district of the Gentiles and people have been waiting, awaiting, expecting this light. And the light is the Messiah's coming. Okay, in the land of darkness. Okay, that's the point. Light. Okay. Know this. Isaiah wrote before the exile and after the exile. Okay. So you understand the exile, there are two exiles, like the first Assyrian exile. This happened around the eighth century. We're talking about we're talking about the um um, the history of Israel. So now I've mentioned this before. Every piece of land, every location, every locality in the Holy Land is called theological or sacred land. We call it sacred uh, geography. Or every town, every place in the Bible, in the Holy Land right now, as a theological significance. Okay, what is the distinction between theological and historical? The historical means the story of human being, every land, once you say Texas, and you know right away the story of David Crockett. Is that one, Crockett? Yeah. And you know San Antonio, right? And you know a story. It's some story of human being that makes you what you are, Texan, or oh, California, you see the Franciscans, you know, spreading all over, like uh, 21 missions around California, Patre, Sierra, you know, you that. And then so history of human beings called history, but when you have theological significance, it means God get involved in human history. So there's a theological um, significance in every location in the Holy Land. Bethel, Bethel means, well, the house of Remember? Oh, Nazareth, what is that? Or uh, Bethlehem, well, the house of bread, where David was born and uh, Raja was buried and Jesus was born, right? So you have, you have every single location has a theological significance, okay? Yes, Denise? So when you spoke and said Bethel is the house of, it cut out? God. Bethel is the house of God. Okay. You should know this. Everybody should know it. Else, everybody yeah. 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 yeah, so we should know it. Yeah, so thank you for asking. And uh, if I am not clear, I will slow myself down and please raise your hand and, and remind me to re, uh, regurgitate, reiterate, or repeat myself. Okay, so thank you, Denise. Yeah. So 
every single place has a significant theological significance. We call it sacred geography. That's why you need to know the place, the name of the place and the meaning of the place because it has God involved in it. Okay? And also there's a history of God. And so here is uh, Isaiah who wrote before the exile. He warned about it and then after exile. And understand that. Okay, So he was bringing hope for the people in exile. There's going to be light. The responsible, responsible, responsorial psalm, again, same theme. This is the string, okay, the needle that weaves everything together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Light is salvation. You're in darkness and you have just a, a candle or a match stick, you know, you ignite the light, gives you hope, it gives you light, it gives you warmth, it, you could burn, you could fire, set fire on something on fire in the darkness of the night, okay? And there's protection from all the wild animals, okay? The mosquitoes, wild mosquitoes, and the robbers, and, you know, the thief, whoever, okay? And the devil hates light, yeah? So the Lord is my light, not just the candle, the oil lamp, or whatever, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Light is salvation. Okay, that's very powerful. Move on to Corinthians. Okay, now. There's the vision. In this community, because they are very, very intelligent and very rich, but they have a lot of uh, graces and gifts from the Lord. And so some have the gifts of tongues, some have the gift of prophecy, some have the gift of teaching. Everybody has a gift and they're so talented and they began to divide. Okay. And they divide into uh, what they call it, factions, political. And Paul was so grieved and said, is Jesus, the Lord Christ, divided? Yeah. So now, if you try to, you know, just suppose you try to get, you get a knife and you cut your eyes into four pieces. How are you going to see? And if you cut your tongue into, you know, 10 pieces, how are you going to talk? Because you're not together. And Paul wanted people to come together. Okay. When you're divided, you cannot see the same thing. You're blinded. Yeah. Again, about seeing. And so, Seeing together, not just as an individual, but as a community, he moves up to another level from the individual, me, you, as individuals. Now we as community, as family, we see together. So we have to have the same, we have the same word, the same vision, okay? And the same mind by having the same purpose. So our purpose here is to study Jesus, the word. Our purpose here is to know that the Lord is seeking us in the Bible. And so we enter into the Bible land and we're seeking God and we meet him in the Bible land, which is what we are doing right now. That's one purpose. Everybody shares the same purpose, to study God. Okay, and we want to go to heaven. We want to be in heaven. And the Bible land, the sacred scripture is heaven itself on earth. Okay, so St. Paul wants us to be united by having, sharing the same purpose. And his purpose, his mission is very simple. Preaching the cross of Jesus Christ, a sign of contradiction, but also of unity and peace and salvation for all people. And he doesn't want us to render the cross empty, meaningless, because we share the same purpose. We want to promote Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross. So I will move to the gospel and um, I will proclaim the gospel again. I will take this part, um, Matthew verse uh, chapter 4, verse 12 to 23. So that is 12. Uh, those are 12 verses, right? Only 12. Okay. You could have the other choice, okay? but I choose this one. The Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. The uh, reading from the gospel, gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, to o you Lord. O Lord. 
excuse me, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. That what had been said through, the, uh, through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali. The way to the sea beyond the Jordan, Gal Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. And those dwelling in the land overshadowed by death, light has arisen. <coughs> Excuse me. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. He said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. At one at once, they left the nets and followed him. He walked along there uh, from there and saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. <coughs> they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat, their boat and their father and followed him. He went around all of Galilee teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and curing every disease and illness among the people. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, okay. Praise be, be to you, Lord Jesus Lord Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay. So there and our first phase, we move to the second phase, second phase, second phase, okay? which is sharing. You're going to uh, be sharing very short, sweet, striking, what you have gathered, collected from the homilies of uh, popes, bishops, uh, priests, deacons. Okay? Uh, for those two newcomers, this is a lot. And then, um, so just attend and see what, uh, what we do now. Okay? So we move to the second phase. Let's, uh, Maria, could you start? sharing what you have gathered and you took home with you when you hear the uh, homilies from the priest. Okay. Um, we... Hello, everybody. Hi, <laughs> Maria. Yeah. <coughs> we, uh, uh, the homily was given by a deacon, uh, Ray Kronsa. Kronsa? Kronsa, something like that. Kronsa from St. Faustina. Okay. Um, she was very um, so a terrible thing to say, right? But he was he was very enthusiastic. But the only thing he focused on was say we're called to be disciples. Okay. We're called to be disciples, and when we came home, the girls and I were like, "So what you get?" Uh, so they they thought the way the same way they critique a literary work. What's in there for me? What well, has to do with me? So that's what we okay. thought it stopped. Like, okay, we called to be disciples, and now what? Yeah. So that I'm sorry that that was it. So we. That's all. That's all well, we got. He repeated well, himself fifteen minutes. The same thing. Okay. So the point is, um, we are called to be disciples, and it is good that your girls raised question triggers a lot of question. What does it mean to be a disciple? Yeah. So very important, and uh, keep thinking. Even when the priests, the bishops, or the deacons never elaborated on, you know, what it means to be disciples, you know, we have to do the work for them. Sometimes people are lazy. Literally, they're lazy. It's just yeah, you read the the, the scripture, the gospel, and you just reiterate it, you regurgitate it, and you say the same thing, and it means nothing, right? So, the listener, the audience, we are intelligent people. We do our own work. Yeah, and that's why we have the CBS right now. The word disciples, as I mentioned, means to be a student. And you cannot be a student unless you study. Yeah, so study means a discipline of the mind. And it means this. 
we are worshiping God with all our mind, not just all our heart and our soul and our strength, but our mind. Studying is worshiping, studying the Bible, studying Jesus is to worship God with all our mind. So this is important. That's what we are doing right now. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, the deacon. We pray for the deacon. Let's move to uh, Marilda. Okay, you're celebrating your Valentine. You have your Valentine. No, 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 no. Okay. I do. Okay, <clears throat> I went. To, oh, well, I've heard Father Joseph Mary from EWTN. Uh, very good. And he, um, <clears throat> he's not related to Mary Jo, is he? <laughs> Joseph Mary, Mary Jo. I know they. They should be. They should be. He's a good man. Um, and I don't know, Father, if this was just in, on EWTN, but they kept, he kept calling this the Sunday of the Word of God. Okay. The, good. Sun, the Sunday of the Word of God. So okay. he, the main focus um, is on one of two ways we are nourished at Mass, especially the Word of God. It's, it's two twofold table, he said. The first table is the word of God. The other okay. is, is the Eucharist. Okay. And he, he started, okay. what a blessing it is for us to have God's word to instruct us. And then, of course, then he kind of went into uh, the uh, hope we saw the March of Life uh, speakers and all that for, for the, you know, pro-life um uh, and how important that is. He, he, he mentioned Fulton Sheen says life is worth living. And he okay. said every life is worth living. So he brought into life a little bit. And so, and then the so what, I, I, he said uh, God's words are consoling words for us. And so our faith at church, he is the, the main what is is a two-fold table of nourishment to feed our souls at Mass. The Word of God helps us grow in wisdom, and the Eucharist helps us grow in holiness. And it's called the Banquet of Grace. Okay. And the, and the now what, um, he, he said, you know, so let us encounter with the living Lord, the risen Lord, who brought light into the darkness of the world and into our lives. And then he, then he was saying that we need to pray God's word, uh, read it and study it. And that's why I'm happy that I'm trying to learn God's word through Faith CBS. And I thank you, Father, for that. You know but we have to learn the word of God. And then he said, we need to pray it. And he says, uh, we need to pray it um, most, especially in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, he, he suggested. And he said that God wants to speak to us. And and that's a good place to be quiet and in, the, in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And he said we need to hear his words. And so um, I, my, my dear friend Olivia gave me this little book it's visits the blessed sacrament and so i'm gonna try real hard <laughs> by saint alphonsus but anyhow I, i'm i'm trying every day to go and just read or pray for 15 minutes or so in the blessed sacrament at saint Teresa's. okay that's it thank you maroda thank you father joseph jo mary, mary from ewtn thank you very much father Okay, so he mentioned about the Word of God, the Sunday of the Word of God. Let me reiterate everything, okay? So I'm listening to you carefully and listening to you, listening to the Father Joseph Mary. So he said, it's Sunday of the Word, and the Word is twofold. Liturgy of the Word, Liturgy of the Eucharist, yeah? Okay, Liturgy of the Word gives you wisdom, and Liturgy of the, the Eucharist gives you grace, Yeah? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you need to bring the word of God. You study the word and bring it to your prayer life. And the best way is to 
pray the word of God and Eucharistic adoration. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, very simple. In front of the Blessed Sacrament, yeah. In, in, yeah. yeah, the adoration is the Blessed Sacrament. And in mm -hmm. any way, you could do it in during Mass, or you have benediction, or you do it at an individual private adoration, right? You do that. Okay, so let me react. Okay. Understand the Word of God is only one and the same. But at the liturgy of the Word, which is all the readings, five readings, right? Five words. It is the ensoulment of the Word of God. And the Eucharist is an embodiment of the Word of God. You, you see the distinction between the two? So when we listen to the word, liturgy of the word, the word of God get into your mind and the, the Greek language is called the psyche. So the word get into your soul. Very important. The presence of the eternal word, the Logos, enters into your soul. And then the liturgy of the Eucharist, that word of God becomes in flesh in the Eucharist species. Eucharistic species, the wine and the bread. And then you take them in and so it becomes embodied. You embody the word of God through the Holy Eucharist. But you unsoul the word of God through the study and the liturgy of the word, study of the scripture. Ensoulment. Now, understand that when we receive Holy Communion, after 15 minutes and 30 minutes, we forget about him. But when you study the word of God, the word of God, okay, in Solomon, it could stay with you a day, a whole week. So the presence, okay, there are fourfold, fourfold presence of Jesus Christ, of Christ in the mass. Number one, in the word. Number two, in the Eucharist. Number three, in the congregation, the people. You meet you, me, we are meeting and Jesus present among us when we pray together. And number four, in the celebrant, the priest. Yeah, but you don't meet your pastor or the main celebrant every day, do you? Or every hour. And you don't receive Holy Communion every minute or every hour, every, you know, maybe every day. But we still could have the Word of God in our mind, in our soul, every breath we take. As long as we say, Jesus, that's it. You see, installment of the word of God. That's what we're doing, okay? So that's my reaction for you. Let's move on. Thank you, Maroda. Let's move yeah. on to uh, Denise. Okay. Okay. So I listened to the homily from Father Trung Song. Trung Song. Uh, yes. He, uh, Elena went to that mass. Okay. And so she was telling me about it. And um, he's a Vietnamese. Yes. Priest, American born. Yes. His name is not Tong Song. His name is a long mound. <laughs> I Trung. don't know what that means. Yeah, true means long and sun, sun means uh, mountain. Oh. So that's the longest mountain um, in uh, in Vietnam is called Trung Sơn. Just like we have the Rocky Mountain, right? In in the States, Canada, going along, you know, from um, Washington State to Canada. Yeah. So okay. we have the Long Mountain. His name is Long Mountain. Cool. Cool. Oh. But he doesn't know that he was born in America. Made in the USA. So <laughs> I interrupt you. He does know Vietnamese. So he does. Yeah, he uh, actually was sharing his culture, the Vietnamese culture with the congregation. He Sharing Catholic, Catholic faith has ties to every culture. And he said it especially has ties to him through his Vietnamese culture. Okay. And he said that the uh, new year is upon them. And he said, happy... Um, Lunar New Year, and hmm. he had some red envelopes. And so he was going to ask the young people questions about the readings and pass out some of the envelopes. So he did that. And then he said, I need to get to the gospel. So he finally got to the gospel and started talking about Jesus is 
the light. Good. And he said, Eucharist means Thanksgiving. The Vietnamese culture, we give Thanksgiving and respect to the elders. Um, on the first day of the Vietnamese New Year, the Lunar New Year. And then he said that, well, his point was, the Lord is my light and my salvation. That was the point. Okay. And so he was inviting all of the young families to continue coming to mass and, um, and how important it is for everyone to come to mass. Uh, this is why the apostles dropped everything to follow Jesus and um, mm -hmm. spread the word of God. So what does this mean to me? Uh, it just reiterated and, and confirmed, you know, a lot of the things that we already have learned and um, to give thanks for what the Lord is teaching us. Okay. Thank you, Denise, and thank you, Father Trung Son. You're welcome. So let me reiterate. Okay. He's uh, he's uh, distributed the red envelopes. Yes. Any money in it? I'm any sorry. money? Any yeah. dollars? Yes, okay. he had dollars in there. Yes. Uh, lucky, lucky money, he said. Okay, very good. Okay. And then he went back to the gospel. And he said, Jesus is the light. Hmm? Yes. The Lord is my light, my light and my salvation. In him I trust, in him I trust, right? Yes. The Lord is my light. And then he mentioned something I need to react now. Uh, very um, you know, quickly responding. Uh, we should not call it the Lunar uh, New Year, nor should we call it Chinese or Vietnamese New Year. And as I mentioned this before, this is just a New Year for us. I New thought year. of that too when he yeah. was... So some of the people just around, oh, China, China is still here, no, 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 thousands and thousands and thousands of years we have been using, we're still using this you know, calendar. It's not like a Chinese, Vietnamese, just New Year. It's a different way of uh, calculating time, okay? But we base it on the moon, on the, well, the, all, you know, the Arabs would do that, except for later on the Romans, they do the solar and then the Aztecs, they would do the solar. A year calculating time simply, but the new year and we call it Tet, which is Tet, which is season. Okay, we have um, uh, four season and eight and kind of a minor season in the year. We divided. Uh, time is circle, circular, not linear. Okay, circular. That's why you have the clock at three hundred and sixty degrees, and you divide the clock into sixty minutes, right? And every minute you have sixty second. So. That means the, the year, the same thing. 60 years recycle, you rejuvenate after 60 years. You know? There are different ways of seeing the world, seeing time and space. It's circular and spiraling. This is, you know, really um, our, our way of seeing the world. Different cosmology. Okay, yes, Denise. Okay, so I don't understand why we shouldn't call it Lunar New Year because if you're celebrating just the new year, then yeah. uh why are why is the vietnamese culture and not celebrating it at the first of the year with everybody else then oh the first of the year is uh, the solar the the roman mm -hmm. and the first of the, the first is the day the year jesus was born so you know the westerner the roman new year we were using the roman time right and we begin with the the birth of jesus christ so for us, like uh, 5,000, this is not like 2,023. This is 5,000 something. <laughs> or maybe for the Indians, you know, they could be 10,000 something. <laughs> I don't know. And maybe 15,000. Right? So for, for us, we begin with the birth of Jesus Christ. This is when Jesus was born 2,023 years ago. Or maybe more. But uh, that's, we take Jesus Christ as the mark for the new year. But other cultures, we say the new year for Chinese, you know, Japanese, Koreans, Vietnamese, just the new year. So you have many, many way of looking at time. So for us, just literally just new year. We don't say lunar or solar or Chinese or Vietnamese. Yeah, just like when we went to the, uh, to the Holy Land, in one location, you have two timelines, remember? 
you step outside the church of Holy Sepulchre, different time zone, and you step inside the Holy Sepulchre, different time zone. Yes. They're still using a different kind. Outside Roman, inside oh, the, the Arabs or the, uh, you know, the, the biblical time. So for them, you say, oh, this is uh, only, only Jewish New Year. No, no, that's our New Year. You don't say Jewish New Year, just our New Year. Huh? So that's better. Just Happy New Year. Just happy Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, Korean, Lunar New Year. Too long. Just I happy see. New Year. I see. All right? So, and so what does, that's my first reaction. So let's make it simple. And we could live in many time zones at the same time now because we're globalized. Huh? So the Australian, they are maybe, is, is that um, today is in California, in Texas, it's still um, Thursday. In Australia, it's Friday already. No? So we are their past and they are our future. <laughs> and you go to Australia and you say, oh, happy Thursday. No, no, it's Friday. Good morning. And you argue, no, no, for them, just Friday, for us, Thursday. Or you argue, just, yeah, it's okay. Be Friday. We are still Thursday. We're one day, you know, after you. We are your past and you are our future. We're globalized now. We don't, we don't mind to have many time zones or we're seeing time. So time is relative according to where you are. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's that's one thing. And the Lord is our light and our salvation in whom I trust and whom we trust. Very good. Thank you. Cha uh, Tung Sun. Thank you very much. And thank you, Denise, for recording and reporting clearly. Okay. And let's move to Dr. Olivia. Olivia. Hey. Good morning, Father. Um I listened to Good the morning, home. Olivia. <laughs> I listened to the homily by Father Roger Landry from Fall River, Massachusetts. Okay. And um, his first uh, line in his homily was, today's gospel is profoundly rich with interconnected pieces. Let's Wonderful. look at the connections and pieces and what they mean for us today. Wonderful. And his last sentence was, the Lord calls us to walk with him in the light. Ask for the grace to radiate that beautiful light. Become intentional disciples. So when he calls you, you can follow him. So the, the gist of his homily was that the Jesus left Nazareth, mainly because they didn't have the faith. They didn't like him. They tried to kill him. But he went into Galilee, which is the where the darkness was, where the Gentiles were. And, and he went to preach to them. And that uh, the disciples that he called or the apostles that he called, all he had to do was just say, follow me, come here. And they dropped everything, right? And then he delved into Matthew, which is not in the, in the gospel, but how Caravaggio, the, the artist, painted the light coming from Jesus to Matthew. And that it was, again, the significance was that Jesus was calling him and he was able to see the light of Jesus and Matthew left everything as well. And so uh, that is what our intention should be. He did state that many of us um, are not like the converts that converted to Catholicism. We, we received our Catholicism through our parents. We went to mass because we didn't really, you know, couldn't say no, you had to go. And many things were kind of forced on us. So we're not enthusiastic Catholics Whereas the converted Catholics are, are very enthusiastic. They, they, they made a decision to go from one religion to another. And uh, he said that our goal is to become intentional disciples. That when God calls us and when he sees, when he's there in the light and we live in the light with him, we walk in the light with him, that we go willingly because we want to be in the light because we love God, we love Jesus, and we want to be with him. So um, my point is, um, in the past, I used to follow Jesus and go to church, mainly because I was a Catholic. And I mainly also for fear, you know, fear of, of, of um, going to hell. And uh, so therefore, I followed him. And then there came a time in my life when I met the 
you and met the people from Sacred Heart Church. And I fell in love with Jesus. And so I was able to, to see the light. So the so what is, am I really truly an intentional disciple? Um, because would I give everything up if God were to call me and say, come follow me? I'm not too sure I'm there yet. <laughs> um, I, I, now I, I wouldn't give up everything and go to some jungle or give up everything to, you know, if, if that was the calling, you know, that God was uh, having for me. Uh, so I need to work on, on being more detached from material things and um, to follow uh, God. That's it. So let me reiterate the call to be intentional disciple of Jesus. The question is, is are we intentional? Are we disciple? Okay. So let's take a look at this and we're going to react on this. Okay. Um, could you ask a first grader? Okay. As a student to be, to think like a college student. No. Yeah. So to think like a college student, even high school, right? So there's a kind of a incremental development in the study to be a student. Like even after you get your bachelor degree, that's just like the beginning. And then your master, you can teach your master and then you get your PhD. Right? So you're really a doctor, you're teaching, you're the doctor. So you cannot expect, you know, um, the college student to think like a postgraduate. Yeah, so studying, being a student is incremental and it takes time. And so the more you know, the more you know about your ignorance and you present your ignorance and you have no shame about saying, I'm not that brighter, I'm not that intelligent, or that, I'm not that knowledgeable, so I'm going to humble. So it's not about, um, about like radically following the Lord, giving up everything, but we could give it up at the moment. We follow Jesus by studying a word at a time, a day at a time. Yeah. So uh, the um, the Catholic um, guilty conscience would not kick in. Otherwise, you feel guilty because I'm not at the level of the apostles. They at once they give up everything and follow the Lord, and that is a very bad way of interpreting the word of God. Let us study that word. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's leave it and uh, by thinking about it, by being thoughtful. And what is that? What does it mean? Okay. So being disciples, students, you study, you study this life and next life, you don't stop studying. Okay. And now what happens is, is when we begin to study like this, it's going to get bored. You go to class, you can get bored because I don't understand this. Is, you're speaking Greek or Chinese and nobody understands. This is a very new language, new culture for many. Uh, and, um, and so it's going to be hard. So the number one, the number one um, attitude we need to have, or uh, we call it mentality, attitude, mindset, or requirement to study is sobriety. Your mind has to be sober, has to be alert, alive, attentive, aware, attuned. Yeah. And that means you need to have a lot of rests, some water, drink. If you don't have enough sleep at night, <laughs> You study, it's going to be really hard, right? You're not up to it. And then we're speaking Greek right now. We're speaking, you know, maybe a Mongolian. I don't know. It's Mongolian. <laughs> it's maybe beautiful language. I have heard songs in Mongolian. Beautiful, beautiful language. Beautiful songs. But we understand it. So that's why it gets bored. Once you, once you understand it, you're attracted to it. You love it, right? So we understand our limit. We understand the, the intentionality. There's levels to degrees of intentionality. Okay? So, Great. I'm not speaking to Olivia. I'm speaking to everybody, especially the two new women. Okay? Uh, Hua and then Tian. And a lot of people give up on uh, phase EBS only because there's a lot of work. There's a lot of thinking, lots of maturity. Yeah? And as well, some people are not up to it because of the level of English uh, comprehension. 
and we do a lot of we are teaching not in Vietnamese I'm teaching not in in Italian or in French or in in Spanish I'm teaching in English so I have to use the American culture the literature of the American culture to speak with you and so somebody has to learn about the American culture not just business and entertainments and and all those things you used to do at church or at home but we we get a little bit farther into the culture okay so that's studying that's student being student and it, it, some people follow it and you learn and i guarantee you when we began we began this how long ago how many years ago already three three years right yeah. at first it was doesn't make sense right and a lot of people drop off <clears throat> because they're going to keep up and if you keep going doing it every day and you get into the language and the culture of the gospel of the bible and you'll be okay right and uh, i may speak to me and to many of you i speak really slow but to many you're speaking too quick just like the first time i went to canada everybody so quick and i went to italy and they, you know the i study italian already but i study italian in houston <laughs> Mm -hmm. Why? What are you talking about? Like, too quick for me. <laughs> too quick, right? So we have to slow down. Okay. So that's part of being student, and you feel like you're stupid every day, every time you open your mouth. I did say say something wrong, but still you don't give up. You don't give up. You just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, and until everybody insults you, you get embarrassed every time. And, oh, okay. That's part of being student. Yeah, being called stupid. Or ignorant, it's not okay. Sure. You don't give up. You keep studying. That's really. It's not about uh, intentionality, yes, but also the uh, persistency you're following. Okay, All right. Thank you, Olivia, and thank you. Yes, Olivia. Oh no, I was saying thank you. <laughs> you thank did you. this. Thumbs you did up. This. Did this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, did, Olivia. Yeah. All right. Miss uh, Christina Hua, do you have anything to say? Did you attend Mass on Sunday? Yes, past this past Sunday. This past Sunday, we went to San Jose. Okay. But we, we got the wrong Mass schedule. We went into a Spanish Mass. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Did you get anything from the Spanish Mass? <laughs> No, but but I read the you know I I I I uh, I watch YouTube you know mass okay. online. Okay. What did the priest say uh, at mass uh, on YouTube? What is the homily? One point. Give us one point. Oh, one point. I don't remember, but uh, from reading the the Bible, um, I know that um, with Matthew today that we read, I know that um, when Jesus called on the disciples like Peter and. Um, and his brother, and then they just like immediately followed Jesus. I said, "Wow, that's that's very you know. I, how can you drop everything? You know, not if God called me today, be his disciple. I just drop my family and just go follow him. I mean, we love Jesus. I I always follow. You know, I love his uh, all his scriptures in the Bible, and um, all his healings. I say uh, today he talked about his healing, and it's the same thing that the uh, I remember John when he was in the prison he told one his, his disciple to go and ask Jesus if he's, he's, a, he's a man that's supposed to come. And it's the same thing. He said, he, he say, um, just just um, just see all his feelings. Uh, the deaf can hear and uh, the meat can talk and uh, the cripple, you can walk. So, yeah. So I always amazed with God's healing. Uh, I always believe his healing. And, um, you know, with my family, recently we have issues and uh, I've been studying the Bible reading and writing in three, uh, I guess it's called Nexio, is that Nexio Divina? That we, yeah. we write, we write the same thing and then we, it's three steps, we write and we listening and then um, we believe and then we pray. And uh, throughout the, the, the scriptures I read in the Bible, it's always faith. It should, if you have a faith as a muster, you know, like God say, um, you can move a mountain. I said, wow, all, all you do is pray, pray. And I, I've been consistently praying a lot. And I think God answered our prayer. That's, uh, okay. uh, okay. that's why I believe that my daughter is coming back to Houston. And uh, she's, she eventually, she got, she healed a lot, like 80%. Very good. So, thank you, brother. And okay. I love to join the, 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 um, the lesson today. I love uh, hearing from each of you and, 
and the experience. Um, because the, the one I read, uh, the one I joined from the Vietnamese group, we just study for the next Sunday. We don't study the the you know, after the fact. We we study for next uh, for this Sunday, so we can understand when we go to mass. We oh okay, uh, you know, at least we get an idea of when the priest talking about the homily, then we understand we already read the Bible ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. But but from you, you just talk about what we learned from the last Sunday. Yeah. Thank you. We have our reason for doing that. Thank you for sharing. We know everybody study for the next Sunday. And uh, we are go not going to do that. We do it on a purpose because a lot of um, studies are not really biblical study, pastoral or you know, personal or political or psychological or sociological. Okay? So this is a sharing of all the homily. So it's called hindsight is 2020. So you get to know what the priest said and the bishop, the pope, the deacons, everybody preaching and you you collect them. What is the point of each person? So you have so far one, two, three, four, five, five, seven, six homilies already. You hear six homilies in one session. What an amazing you know, benefit for us, right? Very different approach to studying the Bible. And we think we know the Bible until you study. We're not studying the Bible yet. This is not studying yet. This is only sharing, okay? Sharing your experience, not studying the Bible yet, right? We understand that. And so uh, we don't do that kind of things. We're going to study the Bible, literally studying the Bible, from the Bible, okay? So this is very different method, methodology of uh, truly studying the Bible, not sharing your feelings, sharing your family problem. We could do that in another session, but not this one. We're going to read the Bible. And so far, you see all these ladies, they've been sharing the homily of the priests, the deacons, the bishop, whoever preached, not their own reflection, not their interpretation or their experience or you know, their whatever they think. They're sharing what the priest said. And it's better to say again what the priest said because he prepared it for us, right? Or maybe he doesn't prepare it. We understand that we need to pray for that priest because he never prepared for the homily. Okay, we have to challenge, okay, the priest. And this is very dangerous because, Father, you know, every week I go to your mass and I write down everything you say. So, Father, please prepare your homily. Okay, we know exactly what you're saying. And then, okay, this is your point, this is your point. This is my, and, uh, oh, something, and then we help the priest to really love the word of God. Otherwise, they, and then you have to prepare ahead of time because you go to church and the priest say nothing. And so we know what the reading is about. We don't need you know, to hear the homily from the priest anymore because some of our priests are very, very holy and very diligent and others are not so diligent. That's why we have this prayer, don't we? We pray for faithful and fervent priests and for unfaithful and tapered priests. Tippets. Yeah, we do have those. Yeah, that's the reality. We are adult, you know, and we say what is the reality. Okay, so that's the way of approach. And I guarantee you, any kind of classes, study Bible, they always study then for the next Sunday. We don't do that. This is the only one we studied the previous Sunday. I challenge you and go around and see if anybody teach this kind of a Bible this way. Is there anyone? Anybody? Okay. So that's why better, because you get to know better and you have the background instead of your own thinking or opinions. You have a priest you know, teaching you or maybe several priests teaching you a bishop or pope. Okay. So I'm going to move to uh, Tien, 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 Tien. Okay. You have anything to say? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can we go on, uh, I, I kind of knew and then I didn't, I didn't uh... Uh, experience for the study the, the Bible. Did you go to so, mass Sunday? It, it, yeah, it, uh, I went to Sunday, but now tell me I forgot because the deacon, he come up and, and give up the whole harmony and he look at his reading. And then time, baby crying and I didn't even do attention. So now okay. talk about me, I don't remember anything, but I yeah. learned today and I will get more attention and I will uh, on with you. It's everything new to me. And, okay. And and even even uh, right here, I'm not good at it. It's what you just say uh, not long ago about English and about the, about the reading, and I end up that way. I can speak, I can talk, but the language I read in certain world I can't understand. 
So okay. I had that little problem and I'm not say, hey, um, I'm stupid and I drop out. I want to learn. Okay, I want to learn. Oh, good. Good. Don't give up. Persist. Well, I will try to share with next time and I will, uh, that just helped me out to put myself in to say, Tian, you got to go back to fourth grade and learn. And and I had to walk by step by the step coming up, but not because I'm praying and then I have Lord give me sign and I'm private. No, I still learn a lot of so. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't have, but a couple of days ago, I have some Hanuman for the reading by the Solomon convert. And I went to put the talk about that, and I think about my family. It, 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 it's why did you, you know, uh, had to convert? So that's all, the only word I remember. <laughs> okay. Saint Paul, uh, not Solomon. Saint Paul. Saint Paul. Saint Paul. Saul. Saul. Yeah. Saul. Yeah. The saw so, is convert. So uh, and all the converting, the thing about I pray for my children, my family convert. And then I got into my head and say, well, he, 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 he pray for him convert. We pray for my family convert. I said, okay, okay Lord. So I, I will have more the next time. And I, I okay. like to, you know. thank you, Father. Thank you for sharing. Okay. So we have a lot of uh, family problems. We want to share personal problems. We want to share. And um, that's what we want to do, right? It's important to share and uh, we pray for you, important. Now, and this uh, Bible study is about studying the Bible. Yes. So we learn to speak um, in a very concise way, to the point, right? So you get your point and you only speak about the word of God. You don't speak about your family, yes. you, whatever. So uh, you have to write it down. You need to yes. write it down. It's the point of the Bible. That's better and then afterward the word of god will help you in your mm -hmm. prayer life okay mm -hmm. it's going to help you in your family life is it going to help you because we have to put the word of god first foremost before beyond above everything and everyone not your family not yeah. you you put yeah, yeah, the yeah. word of god first yeah. and you stay nice. the Bible. yeah it's good yes. to pursue. don't give up a lot of people give up a lot of people because they love of language Okay, uh, comprehension, and then it's, it's really hard, but, you know, just like learning the new language. This is a new language, okay? And we're going to get to the Greek and the Hebrew and the Latin, and uh, it, will, it will throw everybody off. But I am an ignorant person, and I love Jesus. When you love somebody, you're going to study the language of the person you love. Yes. Yeah, you. so you Thank fall in love with a woman, you, know, you fall in love with a man, oh, I'm going to study his culture and his language. So you are in love with God, you study his language. Yes. Hebrew, Thank Greek, you. Aramaic, Latin. Oh, Vietnamese, he's going to speak in Spanish, Italian, I study him. Yeah? Like, <laughs> yeah. Or even Sicilian. <laughs> speak like Thank a mafia. You. So I, I study the language. You know, mafias, you know, Sicilian, they, they love. You know, they love you to death, really, literally, they love you to death. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you, Father. I, I, only, I, 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 when you speak and I understand. Uh, okay, very good. That, so. so, thank you for sharing. Okay, let's move on. Oh, otherwise, we won't have time. We're, okay, 11. Okay, now, uh, Mary Jo, last you raise your hand. You have something to say with us. Share. You're the last, but not least. Thank you, Father. Um, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You sneezed three times. I did? God bless okay. you. You got a triple um, blessing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I went to uh, the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Tyler, Texas. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, and, uh, <laughs> and the celebrant was Father Nick. And he's a young Nick. priest. Okay. Um, so he started out, his first sentence was, if you were good, a good Jew, then you, then this gospel would make a lot of sense. And so he said, we are not, many of us not good Jews. So he, he uh, explained that from the first reading, that was the sort of the, the history, but of the Jewish people and uh, Neptale, Neptali and Zebulun were the lands that were separated from uh, when the uh, <coughs> Jews came back from exile. So anyway, he explained the history and that they were the area of the Gentiles 
And uh, he said that um, that the people lost their identity when they uh-huh. were released from exile. And so that was the key mess key there was loss of identity. And he said that when Jesus came, he brought the light. He brought back their identity. Okay. Oh, identity right. will be restored because Jesus will bring them back, the light of uh-huh. truth. And so he went on to say that um that we are narrative creatures and tell stories about ourselves. The stories that we tell, the story tells us who we are. And he said that um, that a child learns his identity from the love of his father. And he said and that was what Jesus's message was. He was bringing us to understand the kingdom of God, of his father. And he said that we needed to to reconnect with our identity, that we were, that we are children of God and that God loves us. And he, he wants to show us his true identity. And so that we understand our own. And uh, so that was the point of his homily was that we learn our true identity from from Jesus and his mess his unfolding and uh, teaching us about his father and so um, that's why faith CBS is so important that's the so what for me because I need to know my I, who I am. And I need to know that I am a child of God and that that's my identity. And knowing Jesus is going to lead me to truly understand that. So that that was the message that I learned and want to uh, continue coming to Faith CBS. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you for the threefold blessings. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what is the name of the priest again? Father Nick. I Nick? Don't, Nicholas just, Nick? Nick. Yeah. Nick. Uh, Thank you, did, Father they Nick. didn't say his last name. Okay. Thank you, Father Nick, for sharing. And I like the, his way of thinking and history. Important. We're getting to the history of the, the gospel Okay, today. And it's about the loss of identity. It's very personal. And uh, it seems... Our civilization, our culture right now, we have a lot of, we call it identity dysphoria. You know what identity dysphoria is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're confused about their identity. Okay, not just gender dysphoria, but identity. You know, people don't know who they are. They Some people don't even know if they are human beings. You know, they think they are dog or cats. Huh? A man thinking they see a woman, or a woman, you know, saying, you cannot say that a man cannot uh, carry a baby and have give birth to children. You know, the, you say they get mad. A man can give birth to, to children. <laughs> Some people are like that, but they're still human, right? But you reach a point where people have this kind of confusion. They don't know that they're human. I'm just an animal. I'm just a dog, a cat. Maybe I'm a rat or something. Okay. So it's very important that we do have a father. And because of Jesus, he brings us back to our identity as human being. Okay. So what is a woman? Me. I am. Okay. <laughs> I hope you're all women. <laughs> Otherwise, don't, don't be men. Okay. You cannot be men and I cannot be a woman. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to go to this. Third phase, this is truly the study, okay? If you don't have this one, well, then uh, we are like any other kind of, uh, you know, Bible study group. This is important, okay? So we move to third phase. Let's read the scripture together. Verse chapter four, we read again, verse 12. When... 
Jesus heard that John had been arrested. He withdrew to Galilee. We, let's stay with that verse, verse 12. And read again. I am reading it again. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. Now, everybody should have the map. And we have traveled to the Holy Land, right? I hope. Anybody did not travel to the Holy Land? Anybody? Do you have the map with you? Okay. So you have the large map. Right. Okay. So now it's coming, 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 coming. So right there. Thank you, Denise. All right. So it's on there. So now let's take a look. Everything on the Holy Land is sacred. It has theological significance. It means something to God. It means something to us, all humanity. Okay. So take a look. So now, you know John the Baptist, he lived in the south. In the and here, Judea means the land of the land of and I'm running out of internet. Yeah, my internet died on me. Ooh. Okay, so everybody see the map? Mm -hmm. Yes. Anybody lost? Okay, so now you see Judea in the south. Yeah. And then so you have Jerusalem uh, right above. Um, um, to, um, Jerusalem lies right above the Dead Sea, isn't it? Yeah. And then you go down, right? Now, the the low part, the southern part of the country, belongs to the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Okay. John the Baptist lived in the south, Judea. And so when he preached, he preached in the land of Judea, but he would escape. He went to um, this place somewhere close to the Jordan River and he preached there. They live with the community of the Essene, like that's the report. Okay, so he's somewhere down there uh, in the south. Okay, and when he preached to the Judean, a lot of Judean. And Galileans and everybody come all over the country to this this um, prophet job, and then I got frozen again. Can you hear me, anybody? Yes, yes, I hear you, Father. Good, but you are okay. now. We can hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can okay. hear. So now, in, as okay, as we studied. We know that Jesus, in order for Jesus to get baptized in the Jordan River, he has to go down south to meet his cousin, like right? John the Baptist, in the south, right? And he got baptized. And then as last time we studied the Bible, the scripture, well, John the Baptist said, okay, you should baptize me instead of me baptizing you. And Jesus, Jesus said, now, let, it, let, let, let us allow it for now to fulfill righteousness, okay? So he got baptized by John the Baptist. And then after, this is the, uh, the next part, after John the Baptist get arrested from the south and sent him to imprison him very in the, the southern part, right? Jesus came out and uh, he preached, but he went back to Galilee. You see Galilee, the province of Galilee, you see Judea, yeah, and you see Samaria, and then this is on the west side of the river. You see the river 
you know, going down from north to south, you know, see the word Syria, right? See that? That's the river going down, down, down to uh, through Galilee. On the one hand is Galilee, on the second hand, uh, Tetrarchy of Philips, okay? <laughs> Excuse me. You go down to Decapoli and you see Jordan, the Red Word, and Samaria in the middle of Berea. You go down south to Judea, right? And you see the Dead Sea. You see that one? North yes. to south. And Jesus to walk back to Galilee. Okay? <coughs> Instead of going back to Nazareth, you see his town, Nazareth, mm -hmm. right? Nazareth, right? And then instead of going back to Nazareth, well, he, he went there and he read the, the Bible and uh, the scripture from Isaiah and people wanted to you know, throw him off the cliff, remember? And then uh, instead of going back to Nazareth, he went to Capernaum. You see, the Capernaum is the village of the prophet called Nahum. Nahum, okay? And is uh, on the northern eastern northeastern part of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee has a shape of a diamond. You see that one? Yes. It look like a diamond. Mm -hmm. So it's right on the northeastern part of the Sea of Galilee, right? And then you see Bethsaida, which is the town of Saint Peter and Saint Andrew. Mm -hmm. You could walk there, right? Mm -hmm. So from Nazareth to Capernaum, it's uh, 48 kilometers, about 31 uh, miles. It takes you eight hours to walk. So Jesus walked from the south to the north and from his maybe his hometown to Capernaum. Uh, you, you read again, okay? I'm going to read it again for you so you, you see what has going on. So when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. Why? What is it? What is it? What does it mean by withdrew? He withdraw. He withdraw himself. He withdrew. He withdrew or he withdraws himself. That means he was long, no longer in the south. So because when this prophet John the Baptist he was condemning all the corruptions, okay, atrocity from the leaders of the country, and he caused he caused a commotion. He even you know he even uh, the king Herod, right? He got imprisoned, and it was a political movement, and it caused a lot of commotion in the south. And I lost. No, this is not good internet. Okay, now am I back? Yes. Hello, everybody. Yes. Okay. So when John was arrested. It caused a lot of commotion because many were baptized under him. Many followed him from Judea and they were thinking he was a Messiah. That's why the Pharisees and the priests send people out to John the Baptist and asking him, are you the Messiah? Remember? And they were hoping that he was. But then people just keep, keep asking questions about who is this man? What is his identity? He said, no, I'm not Messiah. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a small little small voice in the wilderness. And the voice say, repent, repent, because the day of the Lord is coming, right? So now when he got arrested, everybody's, you know, there's a kind of earthquake, right? And he, he was a voice of the poor of the, I lost my voice again. No, yeah, we hear you. Hello. We yes, hear we can you. hear you, it's Father. No Keep losing my voice. Hey, can you, all right. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. yes. Okay, very good. So we are not still on the map, right? And we went there. So let's say eight hours walking from Nazareth to Caporno. Are you on the same page with me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so he withdrew. So he wanted to stay away from trouble in order to cause trouble. <laughs> It's going to cause more trouble. Yeah. So he threw to Galilee. So mm -hmm. understand. The south Galilee, um, Judea, the north Galilee. Okay. You see that? In the middle, Samaria. You need to know this. Straightforward. And the Jordan River flows from Mount Hermon. Hermon. You see that? The, the snow from that mount 
Those mm-hmm. times we went there, right? Yeah, right. And, it's streaming down, streaming down, becomes the Jordan River and goes down to the Dead Sea. You know, Dead it sea. opens up to the diamond shaped uh, uh, Sea of Galilee. And then that's, that's where you have the civilization, okay, all the cities surrounding it, right? And from the Dead, uh, from the Sea of Galilee, you go down and do through Samaria and you see the, the Samaria and then the Jordan country, right? On the west, on the eastern side, right? And then you go down to the, the Dead Sea, right? So mm-hmm. we need to know this by heart. Mm-hmm. And when we speak, we have a kind of a, an image in our mind, what we're, we're talking about, right? So we say Galilee in the north, Judea in the south, okay? You see Samaria in the central. Yeah, you see that? Mm-hmm. Always yes. keep that in mind. If you don't get that, you won't get the, you have the, the no concept of what we're talking about. These are sacred. Each of the location has a theological significance. Okay, so Jesus would throw from the south up to the North Galilee, but he didn't go to Gennesaret because Nazareth didn't like him. And the situation is that this is after his baptism in the Jordan River, and this after he went into the desert and got tempted, attacked by the devil three times. 40 days, 40 nights, remember? Yeah. Tell me. Sorry. Um, is it mine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Question. where in the map was was he tempted, Father? What do you... Jericho. We went to Jericho. You see Jericho? I don't see it. We went to okay, Jericho, I see it. We? Okay, that's where he... Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we went to the desert and when, where's Jericho? Tell me where's Jericho. In Judea. Above the Dead Sea. West of Jordan River. Uh, before before you reach uh, before you reach um, Jerusalem, right? Yes. Right. Right? That you go down south. Okay. So we went there. Then we. So you have to go yes. from Galilee. Okay. And he wandered around in the desert for 40 days, 40 night, right? And Jericho is not is in the area of Judea, like like a borderline between Samaria and Judea. Before you enter into Judea, you have to pass through Jericho, okay? Because there's nothing in between from Galilee, Galilee to um uh, to Jericho. So you have to step at Jericho to get you know, yourself um um or hydrate yourself or get some food. People, that's the route, and that's where people get brought a lot. Jericho, remember? Okay, but Jericho you go from Jerusalem. To Jericho. Hello. Is Jericho yes. also the place where we rode the camels? Mm-hmm. Yes, where that's the place in the distance where he was tempted. Yeah, that's okay. where it is. Okay. Okay. So Mount Jericho, that's one of the places he was tempted. Jericho, and then Jerusalem. He was brought to the Temple of Jerusalem. Remember. On the, the pinnacle of the temple, it was tempted there, but then so you saw you see him. Now the processes, the processes. He was walking into the desert. Remember, he was baptized, right? And then the op- the 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 sky opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. The Father said, "This is my beloved Son," and he was sent. The Holy Spirit pushed him into the desert. He was in the desert first, tempted with food, and then he brought him to the temple and brought him to Jericho. Remember? Mm-hmm. So desert, Jerusalem, the temple, and Jericho. So three places. So he was tempted in one place. Many places. 40 days, right? But the, the last day, 40 days, the, the devil attacked him. You know, uh, in, the, in 40 days. In one day, after 40 days, he was attacked by the devil. Many places, right? Jerusalem, and then the desert first with the, the with the bread in Jerusalem with you know the uh, the power showing his God and in Jericho with money and the power over the world okay by worshiping the devil so I see that now after that he heard John the Baptist was arrested and so he moved he withdrew back to his own uh, region where he was grew, he grew up there in Galilee but instead of going to Nazareth. He went straight to Capernaum. Now, listen again to this reading, okay? He left Nazareth 
That means he was in Nazareth, right? He withdrew from Judea, went back north to Nazareth, right? And Nazareth, 30 miles, he walked to Capernaum. Now, Matthew said, he left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum. And where? By the sea. Very important. It was with, you know, so the larger image is that he was moving from Judea through Samaria back to the province of Galilee, where exactly in Galilee he was in Nazareth first. And he moved to Capernaum, where in Capernaum, by the sea. Okay. So, suppose you get moving. Now you move from Louisiana to Houston, Texas. Before you move, or you could just say, okay, I have the Katrina, right? I just move straight to Texas, to Houston. Where are you going to live? Where are you going to be in Houston? You're going to live in, on the street or in your car? Where you live? In a, a practical person, I right, would think, okay, I'm going to look for a house. Maybe I rent a house. Yeah? Or maybe I buy a house somewhere in Texas. That's expensive than California. Get a house. <laughs> Either you rent it, you buy it, or you build it. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you are well-to-do, you could buy, just buy it. Yeah? But here, it says, Matthew reported he left Nazareth, which... And, you know, he's, he's, um, Joseph built that house with him, right? We went there, Nazareth. But he moved. So he moved away from everything that has to do with Joseph. Has to do with Nazareth. Right? He moved away. He moved away to this land, Capernaum of Galilee. And by the sea. So you ask yourself, when he moved, did he move alone by himself? Or did he leave his mother alone by herself? Does he have any contact, any more contact with his mother when he was 30 years old? Yes. Yeah? And why, why did he move to uh, Capernaum? Why is it for? You know what it's for, right? So did his mother follow him? It is only eight hours walk, not much, right? Only eight hours. Yeah, 30, and you could walk like 33 miles or kilometers, I think. Eight hours, maybe less. So yeah, he moved and he lived in Capernaum. So when he moved there, did he have any friend in Capernaum? Or oh, he just moved directly to Peter's house and live in Peter's house. Does it make sense that you, you're a newcomer, you're coming from a different city and you go straight to some stranger's house and you stay there. He had to have a place to stay. Mm -hmm. Is it rented house? Or he, he, he went to a cave somewhere, stay in the cave. Or just like to, you know, have a picnic on the, the seashore. We don't know where, right? But we know that he lived in Caponium by the sea. Yeah? Okay. So, in a practical, you know, practical way of seeing things, you need to have a place to stay, to rest, to work. Before you could do your work, you have to have a kind of a financial network support, right? Before just you go out and you, you know, you start your own whatever movement or revolution. So this is how I see it. The hypothesis is that Jesus did build his house in Capernaum. Yeah? He did have his own home where we don't know. Right? He could not live in any one of his disciples' house when he moved to Capernaum. Okay? So that is saying something. He moved from okay, Nazareth to Capernaum by the sea. Okay, now, let's go back to history. 
the south, Judea, the land of Judea, you have two tribes. When Joshua brought the people in the promised land, right? And he divided the land, the holy land, into how many pieces? How many? How many? Twelve, Twelve, 12 tribes. No, eleven. 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 Right? So eleven pieces of land. Okay, eleven. Yes. yes. Okay. Now, because the Levites live anywhere, yeah. Yeah. they're the priests, so they live anywhere in any land. They're gonna be present. They're the priestly clan. Okay. So you could have the Levites in Judea. You could have the Levites in the north. So Galilee. You know, so the two first two tribes that entered into the promised land were Zebulon and Naphtali. First two tribes. Mm -hmm. And along with them, okay, the other eight tribes. So the northern part used to belong to the Israelites, they call themselves Israelites. Okay, Saul belonged to the Israelites. David belonged to the tribe of Judah. And Judah and Benjamin, they live in the south. It's called in the land of Judea, right? So now, in the year 722, something like that, the 8th century, the Assyrian, Assyrian from the north, they came down, you know, Syria, Assyria, they took over the land, okay? They destroy everybody. They took all the 10 tribes, okay? The first one, Zebulon and Naphtali, they put them in exile, okay? So there were no more 10 tribes in the northern part. They scattered them all around, they lived with the pagans. And so the Galilee, then Galilee used to belong to Naphtali and Zebulon, they called it the land of the pagans or Gentiles, okay? <clears throat> right? Understand that. And then around the, um, that's the 8th century and in the um, 6th century or maybe uh, 7th century, the Babylonian went to Judea and took all the people of Judea, Judea Judean and the um, Benjamins, they put them in exile. All right? This, the 6th century. And so there's no more in the nation we call it Israel as a whole, okay? But the king of Babylon was merciful and he gave, he allowed people to repatriate. They came back, even provided this financial support to build the temple back. So he allowed the tribe of Judah to come back. Many people came back to Judea. But the Syrian never allowed the Israelites to come back. And so we have lost the 10 tribes. We don't know where they are. So the only, right now, the only people remain among the 10 to the 12 tribes of, you know, the sons of Israel, the son of Jacob, the, the Jews, the Judah tribe. The other, you know, the other tribes, you don't know where they are. For thousands of years, the only remnant, remnant of Israel, Jacob, is Judah, the Jews. Okay, so now. This is the reason they call Galilee the land of darkness, the land of Gentiles. Or in the northern part, you see Syria see in the map. Mm -hmm. And in the west, you see the Kapoli, the map. See that? There's mm -hmm. another name of it. Okay, you see Syria, the northern Lebanon, okay? And then you in the west, right? West of the um uh, west of the Jordan River, the Kapoli. That's the, the 10 cities, city of the uh, 10 cities gathered together of all the nations. So you see northern part, they call it Galilee, they call it the um, land of the nations. Yes. Tell me. So, Question. Yes. You, you keep saying the capital is west of the Jordan River, but if I oh, oh east, I say east, not west, okay. sorry. Is okay. they live in the, the, the west, but the, I'm wrong. Okay? okay. So Jordan is in, you see, Jordan, the, the country right now, it's in the eastern part of the uh, Jordan River. Okay. It is uh, High, but that's the new, um, the new map, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I got lost because I was trying to find the Capolis. What did you say who lived there? The pagans. Sedeka means 10. 
So the pagans, so all kind of nations, they live there. So they say 10 cities. And you see the um the, the demoniac living in the cemetery there, mm -hmm. the couple. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus would go there. And then he performed exorcism and the people kick him out because they want the devil to stay with them, right? Mm -hmm. So he was there, the couple in that area. And then you see, this is why they call it, there are two names of Galilee, the, the land of the Gentiles or, well, the, the, the land of nations. Or because the Gentiles, they call it the land of darkness. Land of darkness. Okay. Now, Matthew is a very well-versed in history, culture, and literature, and the Bible especially, Bible scripture, literature. And he said that Jesus went out okay, from Nazareth to Capernaum, and he described it by the sea, the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, what does that do? So from the time of Jesus back to the time of the Assyrian exile, somewhere in the 8th century before Christ. For 800 years, nobody called the land Naphtali and Zebulun. Nobody. It's not. Just like 800, 800 years ago, okay? What do you call America? 800 years ago. We don't know the name. What is Texas? We don't know. <laughs> I know, well, maybe Winnipeg, I know. <laughs> it's still Winnipeg, you know, some 800 years. Okay? Chicago, maybe that's a, that's a very native name, right? Chicago is still Chicago. Yeah. But Houston, Sam Houston, 800 years ago, he never existed. <laughs> so it's, this is crazy. It's for the, um, uh, for, for the non-Jews. It means nothing. Oh, yeah, Galilee uh, and Zebulun and Naphtali doesn't mean anything. But for those who live during the time of Jesus and reading this gospel and hearing Matthew said, the land of Naphtali and the land of Zebulun, 800 years ago. Now he said, it's back. We're rec rec reclaiming our land. Wow. This is good news. We've been waiting for 800 years. Now it's back. Eight years ago, the prophet Isaiah, okay, he said something about it. And he pro uh, prophesied. He, he foretold that from this land of darkness, there's going to be a great light. And here now, the great light has come. Okay, so what does this great, great light do? Well, this great light did something really fucking. Okay, Matthew said this. Jesus came out and said, repent. Okay, he did say what uh, John the Baptist said, like all the prophets mm -hmm. said, but he added, but the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's problematic. Mm. Why is it problem? Because he is reviving. He is bringing back the kingdom of God. He's gathering all the lost tribes of Israel back. He's founding, refounding the kingdom of God. Mm. It's the new beginning, is a new beginning of the new nation. Repent, not just for your sins, but for the kingdom. So saying that by saying that is more shocking than John the Baptist said, repent and, you know, uh, behold the land of God, repent for your sins because uh, the Lord is coming and he's going to, he's going to correct you. He's going to condemn and whatever. But Jesus said the kingdom. That's the problem. And he did not say in Judea, he went to this land of darkness. He gives hope. 
Why here? Because the very first two tribes that were caught and brought into exile were Naphtali and Zebulun. He went into this land. He brought them back. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's how you study the Bible. What's the meaning? He gave hope to the people. But he put himself on the line. Alone, by himself, saying that. He start preaching. The kingdom of God is at hand. Okay? This is a recruitment. Those who want to follow to rebuild the kingdom. Not the kingdom of David, but the kingdom of God. Follow him. Okay? So he's the great light. It's significant, the significant, theological significance that now mm -hmm. is no longer the kingdom of, of, of Rome, the emperor, Roman emperor, or the Herods. But this is the new kingdom here. So, now, from that point of view, from that perspective, you see the calling of the disciples. He was not just recruiting followers to follow his philosophy or his ideology. He was calling these men to be part of his kingdom. He was calling these men to build a new kingdom of God. So, when we are called to be, to be Jesus' disciples, we're not just you know, um, being called to be a student, but we are called to build the kingdom. He's willing to lay down his life for this kingdom of his. And so his followers, his adherents, his disciples are called to lay down their life. So this is why he is so radical. Okay, if you want, uh, I have a philosophy. I have uh, some kind of new technique for health and uh, fitness. Just, you don't have to die for it. Okay, you give me some money and I'll teach you the technique, right? But Jesus came out, I don't need your money. I need you to die for it. Are you willing to die for it? It's bigger than just, you know, following a kind of a guru or, you know, something. This is the call to build the kingdom. So now, Alleluia, the question you were saying, I'm not an intentional disciple. Yeah, what does it mean? Just disciple, student? No, no. He's calling you radically to be a soldier, the builder, the founder of this kingdom. Every Catholic, every Christian, every faithful, or every disciple should be this. Understand this. Yeah? Ultimately, all of them died. Persecuted, executed. <coughs> From Jesus to Stephens to Peter, Paul, James, except John, right? Everybody died. That's the original call. Okay? And we have lost that. When you're Catholic, you're called to found the kingdom. Every generation, this call, we echo. Your generation, my generation, our children, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they have to be called again and again to enter into the kingdom by being, being the founder of this kingdom of God. Okay? So, now, this will help us answer the question of the word immediately or at once. They give up everything. What is so important, more important than, the, than your work, your job, your parents, your father, your workers, your business? Let's take a look. So, Jesus preached, say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And as he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, casting. Them. So, now, you see the calling and the place the place he was calling. They were in the middle of their work. They were throwing the net out into the sea. 
imagine, okay, um, Maria was working, you know, on her computer, fixing internet and all those things, and somebody entered into her office and said, go! And you give up everything and forget about your boss and whoever, I don't care, I'm going to go. He went into the workplace. Yeah? Dr. Olivia was healing somebody on an operation, you know, you were cutting somebody uh, up, you know, and Jesus comes and said, go, you give up <laughs> Go. Oh my! Bye -bye. <laughs> Terrible. Oops. Terrible. Yeah, and this was cooking for Ken, her husband, and the children, right? And she's coming and uh, go and forget your dinner. Okay, camera go. The call has to be higher, something much higher than cooking, family, you know, business, money. Am I real, Doc? Yeah? You, it was, you, you were feeding Terry with food, right? He was happy. And Jesus said, go. And the spoon is still in his mouth. And you forget you. I'm going to go follow Jesus. You're going to be in trouble with your husband and your children, grandchildren. That means something is higher than a family. Higher than your personal you know, needs or whatever. Or your business. Uh, Peter, this, this is what um, Matthew reported. Simon and his brother Andrew casting net into the sea. They were casting. Okay, they threw the net and they went. What is higher? Why is it that is higher? Look at the um, the place when he called when he called um, uh, the son of Zebedee, James and John. They were with their father together. Were mending the nets. They gave up on their father and the workers and they left the old man, old man alone. Do your own mending, okay? We, we, we don't care. We just go. <laughs> what is higher? What's so important? And the man, the old man, Zebedee, didn't say anything. What is going on? It doesn't make sense. Unless you have to understand what he was about. The king is calling you. It's time to recover the kingdom. The need of the nation is greater than the need of the family, greater than the need of the individual, greater than the need of whatever business you're doing. They were thinking we are going to follow this king. We are following the kingdom because the kingdom has hand at hand. And he's the one. He's the one. We don't know. We're going to find out. Everybody was expecting, like in Galilee, for 800 years, they heard the, the prophecy from Isaiah, the great light. Now the great light comes. And you know it. John the Baptist was in prison. Now he's coming out. He's not say repenting only. He's saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Just like John the Baptist said, okay, behold the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the world. So they follow the call to rebuild the kingdom. Patriotic people. That's why you see the problem, recurring problem again and again. Uh, should, you know, Lord, uh, make us you know, sit on your right hand and left hand. Who's going to be the first, the greatest in your kingdom? They were following the kingdom of Jesus. That's why immediately they left everything. And their parents didn't seem to have to mind at all. Yeah? So. But, yes, Olivia. Uh, so was it because Jesus gave them the grace to say yes? Because, you know, I don't no, think no, any one of us would human. say. No, no. Well, let's not talk about grace or anything. We're, we're okay. talking about human practical. Okay, so um, suppose oh, you, uh, many of you were baby boomer, right? Some of you were, none of you were born uh, during the uh, Second World War, but you went through the, the Vietnam War, right? So were there a kind of um, recruitment or the call um, to join, um, to bear arms, uh, to join the military? 
because somebody is attacking the country, our own country. And so the manager would say, okay, very good. We need more good men, okay? And the young man said, oh, I'm going to give, give up my work, my job, whatever. Bye-bye, mom. I'm going to go save the country. And they go to Iraq, like Afghanistan, just after 9-11, right? A lot of young men joined. They wanted to save the country. It's bigger than, you know, I'm about to get married. No, I have to stay. Even the wife is pregnant. No, no, I'm going to stay there. You know, give birth to our children. We're going to go fight the war for, for us. It's bigger. It's bigger. We're, we're fighting the war to save the country. Yeah. You know, so we have so many wars and we understand that these are great men. They are patriotic. They want to save the country. They want to save us. And they lay down, they're willing to lay down their life. So in a practical way, not in, you know, in the political, in, you know, in, in the personal way. So you have to place yourself in that kind of mentality for 800 years. Yeah. They've been expecting and expecting. And so these men are willing, ready. I don't know. Anybody call, they, they go. And they, you know, even Peter had a sword. He was a fisherman. At the end, when he entered into Jerusalem, Peter had a sword, a sword, didn't he? Mm -hmm. They were still thinking he's going to make his kingdom. Uh, and he even taught, pray, thy kingdom come, Father. They were still thinking the kingdom on earth of David or something like that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So this is a different way of looking at everything. That's why immediate, I saw that, you know, it's some, in the good time, you know, a, a time of peace, and some of the kids, they joined the military because, well, the military promised that they would have a college um, degree, or they could study, finish their, you know, bachelor degrees, and they get, um, what do you call it, tax exam from whatever they buy, and they have, uh, you know, uh, medical coverage, whatever, but they serve six years, eight years. But that's for my own benefit. But the call is for the country, for the nation. That's why immediate. Yeah? yeah? But now, it turns out, it is not the kingdom of God of heaven on earth. It is the kingdom of God of heaven on earth in God's way, not in our way. How we understand it. And this kingdom means the king has to die to save his own people. Not to kill different kind of kingdom. The king will die to save his people, not to kill, to get his power. Okay? So, now, this kingdom began where? Galilee. The light was spreading all over the land of the Gentiles, the land of the nations, the land of darkness, the great light starts spreading all over. But this light is a gentle light, a meek light, a humble light, a healing light, a salvific light. And that light came from where the word of God dwells, where synagogues. He went to each of synagogues around the diamond sheep, Lake of Galilee. Yeah? around it mm -hmm. and now what why did he do that this is strategic this uh, this is strategy because the way to communicate to travel the best way was by sea seven seas of communication the best way people gather where are the fish where are the water the business so that's why he did that the desert yeah once in a while you see a city in the desert but all the city congregates around the sea of life, Sea Galilee. People there, and then he, he did that, and then he went down south, right? So that's his strategy. A lot of people get to know, and the boat people, you know, the fishermen would spread the word. Yeah? So you so, asked, where did yeah. this uh, kingdom of heaven start? And you said in Galilee, would would you would it be fair to say that it started in Capernaum to be 
Yeah, it's Gal- Kapunum. Kapunum is in Galilee. Right. But so he began in Kapunum. So that just of Galilee. Specific, I don't know. So like uh, Houston is in Texas. Yes. Right? Sugarland is in Texas. Mm-hmm. But he began in Richmond. Okay. People know Texas, they don't know Richmond. <laughs> yes. So we say, oh, Texas. Yeah, we know Texas. Okay. Richmond, West Richmond. I was just wondering why you didn't say Capernaum, you know, instead of Galilee. Oh, no, it's Capernaum. Galilee, you know, we say uh, Capernaum and Galilee, okay. the land of Gentiles. So we say that. We okay. don't miss anything. We have to be specific and exact and precise and clear and cogent and cohesive and coherent, okay. which are the, yes, Olivia. Um, so the apostles, when they said yes to Jesus, they thought they were bearing arms for the... Um, of course. Yeah. Okay. They always thought so, that way, always. So, so the whole time that they were with Jesus, it was a learning process for them then to understand what yeah. he was doing. Yes. So it wasn't that he called them and they knew it was God and, you know, off the, you know, or God. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. So the problem was that even at the end, when he had the last supper, remember, they were preparing to fight. Hmm. Now he went to the city, the capital, and they carried their own weapons to the Garden of Gethsemane. Even the fisherman, Peter, carry his own dagger, remember? Or his sword, whatever. And he, I don't think he never practiced, you you know, fighting with a sword. <laughs> Maybe he should have brought his, uh, you know, fish pole with him. He's better with the fish pole. He, <laughs> he chopped the head of people. He chopped the head of, of the man and he got the ear. Oh, you know, aim, aim at something and they got lucky. Mm-hmm. So... He didn't know how to hold the sword and try to fight, but they still thought that Jesus is going to build his kingdom to the end, to the very end. Yeah? So number one, you see that the how Jesus called him and that the reason behind people follow him because we want our kingdom, we want freedom for our own country. That's a bigger call, okay? Bigger vocation than just my personal, my business and my personal life and my family. Big, and all. we're supposed to be like that religious and priest. We're called to enter the kingdom and build the kingdom of Jesus, of God on earth. That's why you give on a family and, you know, children and business just follow. We have to really renew, revive this, this thinking of the kingdom, fight to the death. Okay, now let's move on. Number one is the why people responded. Number two, who did he call? Number one, a stubborn man who is so stubborn like a rock, he named him Rock. (laughs) Really? He did not call, you know, the generals or the smart people, the scribes, and you know, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and then the priests. He went to the normal people, just like you and I, normal people. Okay, those who are greedy people, okay, Levi's, Matthew, the writer, the author, the evangelist, he loves money, no doubt about it. You want to make quick money? Be a tax collector. Yeah, I don't care, you hate me as long as I have the money. I see, love of money. And you, what do you, what do you call these normal people? You, know, you could call them sinners. These are businessmen and they like power and they like money. No, he called them sons of thunder. They looked down on people. They even wanted uh, the fire from heaven going down, kill off all those Samaritans, those, you know, they call it dogs, right? These are very violent men. They call these normal people. They went to the workplace and call them. And these people make things happen. Then just sit there and read, 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 and write, write. No, they make things happen. Okay, these are practical people. Thomas, a carpenter from Nazareth, is going to build something, a table, a chair, a couch, a house, you know, a rocking, a rocking horse, a rocking chair, whatever. You know, the whole Movement of rock and roll is began with a rocking chair, isn't it? 
Mm -hmm. Aruda, you know that? That's where rock and roll is. I didn't know that, sorry. Yeah, so these people, uh, after the you know, whole day, work in the farm, they go, then they sit on the rocking chair, and they rock, rock and roll, roll, and they begin rock and roll music. <laughs> <laughs> where does it come from? Rock and roll? <laughs> you rock and roll, and you roll around. <laughs> yeah, they call these people. They make things happen, practical people. So who he was us all. So what are we? Where are we from? I'm gonna read to you. This is the description of Saint um, Paul. He was well. He's a Pharisee, he's a lay person, right? They lost the law, and he he killed a lot of people. Okay, so he called the Corinthians, and he described what we are. As disciples of Jesus, here the description. Uh, if you write down First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty six and twenty seven, these are the kinds of the disciples Jesus called, and this is what we are. Is it true or no? We are just ordinary people, not so good, but we don't think we are so bad, but not so good. Now he said this: Consider your own calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise. By human standard, not many of you were powerful. For many were of no, uh, noble, birth, noble birth. Rather, God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise, and the, God chose the weak of the world to shame the strong. And God chose the lowly and despised of the world, those who count for nothing, to reduce nothing, to nothing those who are something. That no human being might boast before God. Now. Let's say these are the kind of people um, the Lord called. Okay, Father, excuse me. What was the ver uh, it was one uh, Corinthians what? One yeah. Corinthians chapter one. One okay. Chapter one, verse twenty six to twenty nine. I'm gonna list then then the kind of people that the Lord calls. Number one. The not so wise, the unwise people. <laughs> the not so powerful, the powerless people. The not so noble people, we are ignoble. The not the foolish ones, we call the foolish one. Then Peter keep getting hit. You know, you cannot go to Jerusalem and Jesus call him. You know, you're just Satan. Get behind me, right? Foolish one. The weak, the lowly. The deplorable, the despised. Aren't you the whole bunch of basket of deplorable? <laughs> the despised. Yeah? And count for nothing, good for nothing. You know, I have a, one, the list of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight kinds of people he called. Not wise, not powerful, not noble, foolish, weak, lowly, despised, and good for nothing. Hmm. People look down at these people and he called these people to make his kingdom, to build his kingdom. If they were to come to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Levites, or whatever, they would argue with him, right? They went straight to the poor people and he called me, just give up everything. Better than what we have right now. We just follow you. We have more hope. Yeah, and whatever he touched got healed. And become whole again. Yeah. Demons ran away from him. No need to have military power. Ammunitions or weapons. Just word. The word. Okay. So why does he do that? Just one, two. Well, I'm good for nothing. However, I'm going to. God is going to use. Because I'm good for nothing. To. <coughs> use me. Bless you. Bless you. Okay, to render those who think they are something nothing. Uh, those who are wise or powerful, or noble, or so strong and high and decent and so loved, okay, that's something he wanted to render all these to nothing by 
the not wise, the unwise, the powerless, the ignoble, the foolish, the weak, the low, the deplorable, count for nothing. That's the way the Lord works. That's the kind of people God calls. Don't we feel that sometimes? So, we belong to that category and we thank God for that, to be his kingdom. So, the moment we think, oh, I'm so wise. He's not calling you because you're wise. Oh, I'm so noble. I'm the elite. Oh, no. Oh, everybody loves me. Oh, no. Because you're despised. <laughs> yeah. So, there's only one way to go. He's going to be your, our wisdom. He's going to be our power. He's going to be our nobility. He's going to be our strength. He's going to be our height. Okay. Grandeur or greatness. And he's going to be our love. He's going to be our everything. That's how you follow the king. He's calling people to follow him as the king. But they have to discover slowly who he is as the Messiah and as the Savior and as the anointed one and then ultimately the Son of God who is God himself slowly is unveiling and unveiling this reality of his identity. Yeah? Okay. Now, have you ever heard of the man by the name of uh, Dionysius of Aropagite, Saint Dionysius. Anybody? Okay. How do you spell okay. it? Say the Saint name. Dion Dionysius. D D I O N I S I U S of Aropagite. That's the same. Okay. Now, who is uh, I'm going to show you the calling of Jesus uh, from the land of the um, darkness of the Gentiles and the nations. This is different, okay? He is the uh, disciple of St. Paul. <coughs> He's a Philosopher. One high ranking officers in the Roman. Paul went to Athens. He preached at the temple of the. Um... Yes. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I, I. I. I looked up Dionysius, and it says it's a Greek god. So I obviously didn't spell it right. How do you spell it again? Okay, I'll give you. It's the Dionysius, right? Yeah. Dionysus of Aeropagite. D O N N Y D O N Y S U S. Okay. There's the other one, Dionysius, okay. The um the one of the Greek god, right? But this is uh, one of our saints. Right. So right. they belong to the next generation of the apostles. Okay. And so he converted when Paul went to Ethan and preached. Okay. He is one of the father of mysticism. He was the one who wrote. This is a new teaching here. Okay. I don't have time. I just mentioned about this. He was um, the one who teach on the hierarchy of the angels, which is the foundation for the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. I don't, I don't think that a lot of people heard about this. How did the Catholic Church get to have the hierarchy? How do you build the kingdom of heaven? You have the hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to have the hierarchy of the angels? The hierarchy of the Catholic Church is based on the hierarchy of the angels. We're just reflecting the hierarchy in heaven. And we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. He said, repent and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? 
So now, this is how he said, well, his teaching is very simple. This is a natural order and the divine order, supernatural order as well. The higher in the hierarchy you are, the more you have to serve. The lower you are, the more you get served. This is a natural order. Let me use this example. You are the mother and the father parent. You serve your children. Your bigger brother and sister, you serve your little brother and sisters. The society serve the little babies. That's the natural order, in, including in the wild. Isn't it true? Mm -hmm. The mother serves the children. You see the ducklings and the mother and the chicken and all the, the, the puppies. That's natural order. If you're bigger, you're stronger, you're, you know, you have to serve the lowly. That's the natural order. The devil did not like this kind of order. He turns it upside down. He makes the lowly one serve the higher ones. He reversed the order. That's why we have tyranny. Okay? That's the devil way. Always, you're on top, everybody serves you. That's the wrong way. That's not the order of God. In night nature, okay? The big one always serves the little one. So he created the angels to serve the lower rank, and all the angels serve human beings where the little, the youngest, you know, brother, sister. So he made the angels serve human being, humankind. Mm -hmm. But Lucifer didn't like it. He said, no, I want to have the power and make everybody serve me. If you lower me, you serve me. But God said, no, God serves everybody. I come to serve, not to be served. That is the kingdom. That is the kingdom of heaven. That's why he want to revive, to bring back, to correct divine correction, just to say, okay, God is here to serve us. And if you're, you know you're bigger, you're more powerful, you know, you're, you're better and knowledgeable, wiser, you serve the lowly. And this is the hierarchy in the Catholic Church. You're the Pope, you serve everybody. You're the Bishop, you serve everybody. You're the priest, you serve everybody. You're not the boss. That's the order of things. But now we, we have the different mentality where the mindset, that, okay, all people serve the priest. The apostles, they came to serve the people. Paul served. Peter served everybody, you know. But now... Don't even know how to wash your clothes or clean the room. Some problem. Some really, really something goes wrong. Yeah, something for you to think about the kingdom of heaven. Okay, uh, the, his, uh, his writing. So his cosmology is very different. So the Dionysius, Dionysius of Arupagai. Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you, um, I just mentioned that and you're aware of it, what the kingdom of God is about, right? And Jesus said this from the beginning, well, who's the greatest in the kingdom? He put the child right in the middle of everybody. Convert yourself to be like a child, greatest, because he got served. He's the smallest, is the most little, okay? Little, yeah? And if you do this to one of the least of these, my brother, you do it to me. That's the kingdom he wanted. Okay, the end. Oh, wow. Wow, Father. It was, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, smoking. <laughs> it's very good, Father. Wow. Recorrect, okay, correct. And uh, you have a new way of seeing the priest right now. It's really exciting to become a priest because you are called to arm 
to found the kingdom of heaven and to serve. And literally all the young men who you know, came out, joined the military just to save the country, to protect the country, they're willing to lay down their lives. And they put everybody ahead of them. That's the motto. You put the people ahead of you. Okay. And then if there's a, you know, the attack, you're going to put your body in front of everybody and you become the shield for the people of the nation, of your own. Yeah, that's called to serve. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Glory be to Thank the you, Father. Father. Okay, let's pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it, As it was, was in the beginning, it is now, and now, and ever shall be. be. World the Lord be with you all. And, and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, Father. Okay. Thank you, Thank Father. You, everybody. Thank you, everyone. God bless you.